Well, good morning, Launch Point. As you can tell, we got a special day today. It's our Senior Recognition Day. It's a real special day in the life of our church, our students, and most importantly, of course, in our students' family. And so we just ask you today, in a few moments, we'll have a time of prayer to keep praying for our students as they go through these days and they make life choices and things they'll be doing. But we're going to go ahead and begin recognizing our students. And when I call your student's name, if you have any, if you're a family member of this student, please stand as we call their name to come forward, okay? Kyler Lindsay. Dalton Patton. Joshua Pulaski Chambers. <clears throat> Madison Lyles. Maddie Johnson. <laughs> Lena Marie Grease. Emma Drew Smart. and Caroline Walls. We had a couple that could not be here today that was gonna to participate, Carly Olive and Kaylee Fuller. At this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer and pray for our students and for their families, okay? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to come to your house and worship. We thank you for these awesome, stinking, cool, bona fide graduates standing right here in front of us, Lord. And Lord, we just lift them up to you, God, and pray for them and their life's decisions they are making and the choices of where to go to learn and to live the life you've given them, God. We pray, God, they seek you in all that they do. And Lord, we thank you for their families that have loved them, supported them, and been there for every step of the way, God, as they've gotten to this point today. We thank you for this wonderful moment of accomplishment, God. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Hey, y'all have a seat. All right, it's time to recognize our uh, graduates from college. I believe we've got two here this morning. Uh, when I call your name, just please come up and uh, get your Bible. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, Sydney King. And then the second we have here this morning, I believe, is Bailey Terry. She graduated about uh, a few months ago. Our congratulations to our college graduates. And uh, real quick, I just want us to say a word of prayer over them, and uh, then we'll continue with our service. Let's pray. God, just come to you this morning. Thank you so much for each of us that is here. And God, I thank you so much for our college ministry and our graduates that have put forth a lot of effort and time of their life to prepare themselves for this the upcoming world. God, I just pray that you'd be with each one of them as they uh, go to this next part of their life. God, as they look for jobs and work, things that will be going on. God, just protect them, give them courage and strength, and above all, give them strong faith. God, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. That's awesome. Come on, let's stand together this morning and go into worship. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you already won. Anyone. There is no weapon that 
goes through generations I know that you will keep me covenant I'm calling on the God Let's sing, oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness.
You are the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. God, we ask that today as we continue with your service and your word gets brought forth, that you would let it touch hearts and minds, open up hearts and minds to receive you today. Not so nobody leaves here the same way that they came in, whether it be their next step in their walk with you or a first time decision. Nobody leaves the same way. And we ask that today in your name name above all names. Amen. We're on a journey of talking about seeds and seed would represent the beginning of things like like everything that you have ever been through in your life, everything that, that you have experienced in life is actually a seed that has been planted so that you could help others along their journey. They're, they're seeds that, that take root and they grow. And, and when we go through things, we can have conversation with people and go, you know what, I've been through that or I've been through something similar like this. And, and you can get on a journey and you can turn that into actually spiritual conversation uh, along life's journey with people. Even the, the good stuff, the bad stuff, and everywhere in between, it is a seed that is there to help you to help others on life's journey. Because if you think about it, a seed is that which has absolute incredible power. I mean, it's kind of one of those things, it's just amazing what a seed can do. A, a seed is something uh, that has been given that can create everything that has been promised. But you think about the potential is always in the seed. You know, it's been well said that the mighty oak trees on planet earth is just a little nut that, never, that refused to give up. And so a seed has that thing that can become a powerful thing. And today we want to talk about the seed of closeness, the seed of intimacy, the seed of having an encounter with the almighty, all-powerful, living God, with the, when eternal God would collide with everyday life. When we would have that seed of closeness that we could have an encounter with God every single day, that we could have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, that we would be in tune, be walking in step with God every single day of our life. Why? Because the reality of many Christians across planet earth is you have never been close to God. Oh, you had an encounter with God because you are a Christian, so therefore you encountered him, but there has never been a closeness of relationship. There has never been an intimacy. There has never been that encounter daily. Uh, it's never grown in that area. And some of you, the reality, uh, there, there may have been a time when you were close, but you have gone on a spiritual vacation or you've become very lax in your Christian life. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, it says this. It says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And my prayer this week has been that you would come into that realization that you can have closeness with God. That you can come into that place that reality of life where you understand that you can walk with God every single day, that you can experience God every single day, that you can have an encounter with God every single day, that you can have the Holy Spirit power indwelling you every single day, and you can walk in the activity of that moment and the activity of that power. Uh, because the reality of the day is many who would claim the name Christian your relationship with God is very distant. You, you talk about like he is the God of the Bible, but not like he is the God of today. 
You talk about like the Holy Spirit is somebody who is obsolete and who is not a, a present reality in your life. Like he was, he was somebody who, the Holy Spirit was somebody who showed up in the book of Acts and did some cool things. But other than that, the Holy Spirit has no activity on planet Earth. And that's not the case. The Holy Spirit indwells the life of every single person believer like he like God used to do things and God used to do miracles but now not so much and so you don't have a closeness of relationship you you'll go to church and you're and you're here today and and you put on the veneer but you're not close you'll you, you the reality is you don't give control of your life to God like you you're not going to invite God into your future you're not going to invite God into your present you're not going to invite him into your family you're not going to invite him into your friend group because you know what you do in your friend group and God just simply doesn't have a place there and you're not going to invite him into a job because things can go south on the job and but we don't need God in that moment and and we don't need him in our family moment because wow the family has so much dysfunction in it it would be like it would be a shame for God to show up in that moment and so you it, you're not going to invite God into your finances now you like the fringe benefit because you got some fire insurance, but you don't have the activity of God in your life because you're not close to him. And, and you need to know this. You need to understand above anything else. If you miss everything else, you haven't heard anything else, understand this, that you can know God in an intimate way. You can know him intimately. You can have a closeness of relationship as Moses, who God spoke to face to face as a friend. Second Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> now, the translation that I'm reading is not going to be the exact translation that's on your screen, but you'll, you'll get the gist of it. It says, whenever though they turned to face God as Moses did, whenever they, that would be you, that would be all future Christians, whenever they turn to face God. So that means that God says, hey, you know what? I'm going to put the ball in your court that I'm going to invite you into chasing after me. I'm going to invite you into the place where you get in my presence. I'm going to invite you into the closeness of relationship, but you've got to choose it. You've got to choose to walk in that closeness. So it's the decision of yours of whether or not you would go after God, whether or not you would be close to God. It says that God removes the veil, and there they are face to face, and they suddenly recognize that God is living personal presence not a piece of chiseled stone. And when, they, and when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation is not recognized and it is obsolete. What does that mean? That means that too many were brought up of thinking that church is the list of do's and church is the list of don'ts. That God is the list of do's and God is the list of don'ts. And you miss the closeness of relationship because you are afraid to get close because you were afraid you were doing something that was on the don't list or you weren't doing something that was on the do list. And God says, no, it is an intimacy of relationship. It is an encounter with me. And it goes on to say that would free that, that frees us all up. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face. And all, so we are transfigured much like the Messiah. Our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives. And we become like him. And so the goal of today would be to get you to enter into the chase, to get you into the chase after God, to get you to enter into the reality that there is a seed that you can know, there is a seed that has been offered to you that you can be close, that you can be intimate, that you can have daily God encounter moments. Why? Because you need that power in your life, especially in these days. You need that power in your life. You don't just need words. Why? Because you're facing situations. You're facing situations individually. We're facing situations as a nation. We're facing situations as a world that words simply cannot fix. That we need an encounter with God. That we need the presence of God to fix. Here's what uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and preaching were not with wise persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's 
power. We don't need man's wisdom. We need the power of God. That's what I pray over this house when I come into it every time or when I'm just driving by, I'm praying, God, show up in the house. We need your power. They don't need to hear from Shane. You definitely don't need to hear what I have to say. You need to hear from God Almighty. He's the one who needs to penetrate your heart. We need the Holy Spirit to flood the house. We need the Holy Spirit to move and to speak to people. Why? Because it cannot rest on a man's power. It's got to rest on Almighty God. God. Why? Because we need encounter with God. We don't need an explanation. Why? Because we get in situations of life. Here's what I have found. Explanation really never changes anything, but an encounter with God changes everything. Would you agree with that? It changes everything. The presence of God changes everything in life. Encounters go beyond explanation. John chapter 19 beginning in verse 17, we're not going to read this, the, the passage, but it's a great, great picture of this. There was a blind man that Jesus healed. And the religious crowd, the religious police of the day, if you will, the Pharisees, they came and they said, how did he do it? How did he heal your eyes? Did he, did he, did he hawk on them? Did he make a bud pie this time? Did he slap you on the head with one hand? Did he slap you on the head with two hands? Did he take off his Levitical robe and throw it in your way? Did he blow on you? And some of you get the symbolism that I'm using here. Did he stick his fingers in your ears and make you go bye-bye? You know what I'm saying there. We won't go any further with that one. Those of my generation, a little Ernest Ainsley there. But did he, why, how did he do it? How did it happen? And the blind man gave the explanation. He said, I don't know. A little bit ago, I couldn't see. I hadn't seen for years, but now I see clearly. Why? Because he had an encounter. He didn't need an explanation. The encounter, the closeness of Almighty God. And we need His presence. We don't need practice. We need His presence. Well, okay, how, how do we get there? There's a guy in the, the Old Testament. He's actually one of those listed in, in Hebrews chapter 11. His name is Jacob. And Jacob, to kind of give you his history... Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, okay? He is the second born son of Rebekah and Isaac. The first born son was, thank you, one person in the house reads their Bible. It was Esau. Jacob and Esau, you've heard the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, the first born son was the one who got the birthright in this particular day and age. And Esau came out first, and Jacob, if you know the story, was hanging on to his heel he was hanging on, holding on for everything that he was worth. Esau grew up to be kind of the hunter of the family. He was the rough and gruff, and he was, uh, he, he was quite a bit of a hairy person. And Jacob was kind of more the stay-at-home and the air conditioner kind of guy. Nothing wrong with either of those. You, you know, he was just that kind of guy. And Jacob actually grew up with a, with a manipulative spirit. He, he liked to manipulate situations. He was, he was a deceiver, as we'll find out in just a minute. That's what his name meant, was deceiver. And, and he, he, as he got older, he, he went to work for a man by the name of Laban. Everybody know the story of Jacob and Laban? You don't know the story, I'm going to give you the Shane version of Jacob and Laban. You can read it later. Jacob fell in love with Laban's beautiful daughter. He had a daughter that was beautiful, and, and Jacob had worked for him, and he came to the arrangement that, that he would marry Laban's beautiful daughter. On the wedding day, Laban did the old switcheroo because Laban also had an, another daughter that was ugly. Everybody say ugly. ugly. She was just plumb ugly. Bless her heart. She was ugly. It's what the Bible says. I mean, you need to read your Bible. It's full of stuff like this. And it says, I mean, it was like the wedding ceremony. You may kiss your bride, lift the veil, and ah, type ugly. So the deceiver got deceived. And his life went into absolute chaos at that moment. And when his absolute chaos happened in his life, he began to run away from the things of God. And so many do that. When chaos happens, we go, you know what? Uh, I don't need God anymore. I'm going to figure it out on my own. And that's where we pick up the rest of the story of Jacob's life in Genesis chapter 32, uh, beginning in verse 24. It says this, so Jacob was left alone. 
He was away from the distractions. He was away where there was nothing else going on. There was nobody else around. And some of you who have been believers for a long time, you know this principle. Others of you who have been believers for a long time, you need to learn this principle. And those of you who have been a believer for 30 seconds, you need to learn the principle of aloneness with God. In the presence of God. Because in his presence, one moment changes everything. He was left alone. Alone from the distractions. And that's where God begins to do a work in our life. Of alone. You go, man, for me to be alone in my house, I'd have to be up at 4 o'clock. Join the club. Hey, it's all right. Get up. Get up so you can be in that moment of silence with God. And it says that a man... And there's two lines of thoughts on this. It says a man, and so there's, there's a line of thought that says it was an angel of God, and there's another thought that says, hey, you know what? It was God himself, and you can line up wherever you want to. It's not a test of whether or not you're going to get to heaven. It's not a test of fellowship. I don't, it doesn't matter because you've, you've heard both probably over the years, or maybe you only go, oh, no, that was an angel. And the others say, oh, no, that was God. I, I don't know. I don't know. About 50% of the writings that I, that I read on this, it, you know, it, it, said, it said it could be either. So it says, it says, it says a man wrestled with him till daybreak that he he got into a wrestling match with either an angel or with god whichever you want to line up on and it says when when the man saw that he could not overpower him he touched the socket of his hip and i'm going why would god do that meaning that he he dislocated his hip if you read the story of Jacob, you'll find that the reality is he spent the rest of his days on planet Earth walking with a limp because he had an encounter that night. And it's, it, he did that, and I'm going, why would he do that? And I believe it's this, because sometimes the only way that God is going to move in your life or have the right to move in your life is when he gets you the place where you're weak. When he gets you to the place where you have nothing else, where you, where you can't do anything without him, and that's where Jacob was in the moment. He says this, it goes on. And it says, his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man, and then, and then the man said, let go of me, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let go unless you bless me. Then the man asked, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Trickster, deceiver, manipulator. And the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but it will be Israel, which means prince of God. He encountered God, get this, and he got a new identification. That's why when we do river baptisms, our shirt says identified. He got a new identification when he encountered God. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him. And Jacob called this place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face. And yet my life was spared. Three things happen in our life when we encounter God. Three things that happen when we encounter God, when we Get into that moment of closeness. When the seed of closeness leads us to encounter three things. Number one is we get a new strength. We get a new strength. At some point, at some point you've got to go, you know what? I, I can't do this on my own. And I need the strength of Almighty God. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need God to walk through this situation with me. That I, that I don't need to lean on my own understanding because my, lim my understanding is very, very limited. But I need to lean in to the reality of the presence of God and get close. It's Senior Recognition Sunday. And guys, this verse is for you. This is, my, this, is, this is your pastor's prayer for you. And I want you to understand, and I want you to understand what God had penned in the book of Isaiah is so relevant for your lives. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29, it says, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. 
It said, even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings of eagles. Seniors, have y'all ever seen an eagle fly? Just raise your hand. Have y'all ever seen an eagle fly? I love you seen it. If you've never seen an eagle fly, it's like one flap. And they're soaring. And they're just soaring through the sky. All the other birds are like flapping with all they worth. They have to stop and, you know, they'll land on a power line or a tree or so, and they'll get a lot of bite of food, a little bit of water, and then they'll go, and they'll go a little bit further, and they'll do the same thing. But that eagle's up there just soaring. God soared with the eagles. You know, I've often wondered why, why God pinned it as eagles. And I think the number one reason is because eagles always soar. Because if he had said, it doesn't say that they'll mount up with wings as turkeys. You know why? Because turkeys don't fly that far. And see if you agree with this. There's a season called turkey season. Do you understand that? Where you can go out and you can legally kill a turkey. You understand that? Why? Because they are easy targets there is not a season it is a federal law I think you can't hunt eagles why they're protected and guys let me tell you for those of you who will go to university setting you're going to have every opportunity under the sun to run with the turkeys your mom and daddy have trained you well We've done the best to instill biblical principles in you here. But if you run with the turkeys, you will become a target and somebody will shoot you down. You better learn to run with eagles, to soar with eagles. Because here's what God says. He says, when you soar with the eagles, he says this, it goes on to say, they will run and not grow weary. Why? Because when you're soaring with the eagles, it's no longer about your strength. It's in your reliance and dependence on the encounters you have with God. And they will walk and not faint. In verse 26, Jacob said, I'm not going to let go. And he said, let go. It's it's almost daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not going to let go. What's that mean? That means you hold on even when it would be easier to let go. It would have been a whole lot easier in Jacob's life that night if he had let go when the wrestling match started. He would have not spent his days walking with a limp. But he chose to hold on. Hold on even when you're hurting. After he reached his hip, he still held on. After his hip was dislocated, Jacob still held on. Hold on when you can't clearly see God. Just trust the Father's heart and trust the Father's hand of where he would lead you. Hold on when you're not feeling it. You know, we we live in the feeling it day. Well, I just didn't feel like going to church. I didn't feel like worshiping. I didn't feel like reading my Bible. I didn't feel like praying. Soar with eagles even when you don't feel like it. Soar with eagles even when you don't feel like it. Hold on even though you may not be winning. Hold on even though you're old. As best I could tell, Jacob was 97 years old when this event happened. And he's wrestling. He's wrestling with an angel or God, whichever you would say. Hold on, I want it bad enough that I'm not letting go. I'm not giving up. I'm holding on to the only one who has the power to bless me. I'm holding on to the only one who has the potential of the seed to make the seed grow into fruition of an intimate relationship, of a closeness, of an encounter with God Almighty. You'll get a new identity. You'll get a new identity. He went from Jacob deceiver to Israel. Jacob deceiver to Israel, prince of God or triumph of God. This happened in Genesis. You fast forward to the book of Exodus. Moses had an encounter with God at a burning bush. Do you remember the story? 
Think about this. He said, well, who, who do I say? What, what, am I, who, what am I supposed to do with this? Who do I say sent me when I go back and tell them this? And God spoke to that burning bush and he said, tell them I am. Right? You remember the story? Tell them I am. I am sent you. And he said, tell them I am. And I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. But wait a minute. His name was changed in Genesis, he was already known as Israel at this point. Why not? I'm the God of Israel. Because that's Jacob's good side, God. Why, why did you put in this moment, I'm going, why did he say this? And I had really never thought about it. I'd really never tuned into it. And I'm going, wait a minute. He said, I am the God of, of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. He's saying this. I want the world to realize that I am the God of Jacob too. That I'm the God who wants you even though you struggle. That I'm the God of the downcast. I'm the God of the one in the gutter. I'm the God who looks hope. I'm the God who, for the one who looks hopeless. I'm the God who says I've the one who says I've given up. I'm the God of the one who says I'm struggling. I'm the one he says, I want to be a part of the place where you say, I don't want anybody to know that place. God says, I want the closest of a relationship to go into that place. I am the God of Jacob. Full of mercy, full of truth, full of grace, full of wisdom. The God to the hopeless. And thank God he's also the God to the skeptic in that moment. And it says this, he said, I'll, I'll give you a new joy. I'll give you a new joy. And what you've got to understand is joy is not circumstantial. It's, an, it's not external, it's internal. You can have joy regardless of the circumstance happiness is completely related to your circumstances like in the right situation everybody can be happy now we know a few people who they, they wouldn't be happy if they had everything handed to them on a silver platter because they're just no sour mouths they would never smile they would never experience any happiness in their life they're just misery of humanity maybe y'all don't know those i do i mean this is really reality but most everybody can be happy if the circumstances are right. But joy is something that's internal. Joy is something that comes from the Father. Joy comes when you give your life to God and you realize there is nothing on earth that compares to that. And he says this, he said, I, I won't let go until you bless me. And that's what he's saying. It, we, we read that and we go, oh, well, he wouldn't let go to God gave him something. Till he gave him something materialistic. Till he gave him some money. Till he gave him some material things. That's not what he meant. He said, I won't let go until you bless me, till you give me some joy about my life, internal joy. And when you realize that, you begin to realize what the Bible's meaning when it says that God will give unspeakable joy, full of glory. He said, I'm holding on to the power of the one who has the ability and the only one who has the ability to make a difference in my life. We sang a song, the last song in our worship set was called, Same God. It starts out with these words, I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. Would you stand and let's worship with that song again? I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up. Now to do the same thing for me. Well, let's sing this chorus. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing.
some of you, your, your soul is simply not right. Or you've been trained and you've learned over the years how to fake it. And how to fake all of humanity out and those who would even be close to you, you would fake them out. To make it look like it's okay in your life. I had five conversations this week that were all the same. Two were with pastors, three were just people that I just had conversation with. And they all started like this. Shane, is this the beginning of the end? Are we in the last days? And I said, well, you know, we're a day closer than we were yesterday. I said, if you line up what the Bible says, and I know the Bible a little bit, and know what the prophetic voices have said, and know what the book of Revelation says, I said, guys, I, I don't know. I, I, we don't have the authority. I said, we can discern and say, yeah, we, we're close. And my response to all of them was the same at the end. I said, here's what I do know. I said, while we're here, in this moment, we better make sure that we do everything to make sure that everybody that we know is ready to step over into eternity because that's reality that there is an eternity to be faced whether that's today, tomorrow or 50 years from now 100 years from now you see the, the reality is simply this and, and the reality is 100 years from right now 100 years you're going to be just as alive you're going to be just as alert you're going to be just as awake you're going to have all of your senses about you the only difference is you're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell 100 years from now 100 years from now, you'll be in heaven or you'll be in hell. And everybody that we know will be that same way. My generation, I don't know any 152-year-olds on planet Earth right now. You'll be just as alive, just as alert, the only difference is you'll be in heaven or you'll be in hell. And for some of you, what you need 
is you need the joy of your salvation restored. And you need an intimacy with your daddy God. And you need a closeness with him. For some others in the room and others who would be watching online is you need Jesus. You need a relationship with Jesus. Because 100 years from right now, you will either be in heaven or you will be in hell. Last verse is coming up on the screen right now. Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Would you read it aloud with me? You make known to me the path of life and will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Believer in the house, believer watching online, make the decision today, make the decision today to chase after God with all you have, to enter into closeness of relationship, to enter into the presence of Almighty God, walk in the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And others, you simply need to get your right, life right with God today. You go, Shane, I, I don't know what to do. I'm going to help you. I'm going I'm to lead you in a prayer. You say, I don't know how to pray. That's okay. I, I'm going to help you do that too. I'm just going to let you borrow my words. If today is the day that, that you need to encounter God for the very first time, that today may be the first day that you heard that 100 years from now you'll either be in heaven or hell. And the only way that you get into heaven is by having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And today is the day that God is speaking to you. Just invite you to pray a prayer with me. Don't pray it out loud. Say it straight to heaven in the moment. Say, Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross in my place. And today, I ask that you forgive me for doing my own thing. That you would forgive me of my sins. And that today you would make me a brand new person, that you would give me a new identity, that I would be identified as your child. Today I open up my heart and I open up my life to you. I invite you in to be my Lord and to be my Savior. And I thank you that now I am your child. I am a child of God, and you are my God. If you prayed that prayer in just a moment, we're going to begin to worship. We just invite you to come to one of us here at the front and say, hey, I prayed that prayer with Shane. We're not calling your name publicly, not bringing you on stage. We're not embarrassing you in any way. All we're going to do is pray with you. Maybe there's other prayer needs, prayer concerns. The altar is always open. It's always a privilege for us to pray with you. The only thing that we ask that if you made that decision today to become a Christ follower or you need to come for prayer, you need to come to the altar, that you do not wait. As we begin to sing right now, if you need to come, you come. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I lean on you. I lean on i uh-huh.
so much for being here today if you're new i would love to say hello to you give you a gift on behalf of the church i will be standing right over here to my right students you have your final mission team meeting tonight at five and right on that five o'clock uh and then many of you know some of you may not know that carl blankenship uh ran into the arms of jesus friday or thursday night or friday morning uh and the family will receive guests uh tomorrow night tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, four to six in the lobby. So if you want to come by and love on the family, they'll be right there in the lobby for you to come by, hug their neck, let them know you're praying for them uh, and just encourage them uh, just a little bit. Carl didn't want a service at all. And so they're honoring those requests, uh, but they do need to be shown some love in these days, obviously. Uh, and so we appreciate you doing that. As always, you can text to give, give online, drop in a wall slot, or give at the Connect Desk. The college ministry had a barbecue sale yesterday. I believe they have a couple of packs of barbecue. I think they're pound packs. They're five bucks. So if you want to pick one up and have your lunch or put it in your freezer and save it for a rainy day, whatever you want to do, make yourself available. It is at the Connect Desk. Hope that you have a wonderful Sunday afternoon, everybody.